Okay, very good morning to all of you in this historical lecturing hall of the Czech Academy of Sciences. My name is Tomáš Baše. I'm from the Institute of Inorganic Chemistry of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And so we, as the Institute, have the pleasure to host our today's speaker, Professor Anne Andrews. Professor Andrews, Anne is from the University of California in Los Angeles. She's a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, psychiatry, and as you can tell from this combination, the research which she is conducting is very interdisciplinary and very up to date. So it's about brain and I hope you will enjoy today's talk. One last thing which I'd like to mention is that Anne is here as a Fulbright specialist and uh, in addition to the Czech Academy of Sciences, this talk has been supported by a Czech company, Kathem, which is producing advanced chemicals. Thank you. And it's yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's really exciting to be here um, and to talk to you about the research that we do in my uh, research group at UCLA. I hope to hit just a couple of high points today to, tell, to allow you to take home um, a couple of messages. Uh, so the first has to do with the title of my talk, which is why the brain is not like a computer. Um, we often hear in popular culture that our brains work like computers, or we try to design computers to work like our brains. Uh, the second part, I would say, is almost impossible because we don't know how our brains work. So how can we make a computer work like them? Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, biology and the chemistry of the brain, the work that we're doing to develop sensors so that we can learn more about how the brain works, and then what we can do with those sensors to help people with diseases and to also give people information to improve their health and wellness. Um, so I'm at UCLA, and we are right next to Hollywood. Um, I love Hollywood. My father loved movies. He moved from the East Coast of the United States all the way to Hollywood as a 16-year-old um, because he loved the movies so much. And one of the things that the movies have done for us um, in things like Star Trek Next Generation um, is to teach us that space is really one of our great final frontiers. This is my friend, Professor Andrea Gez. And she won the Nobel Prize in 2020 for her work using large adaptive optics telescopes at the Keck Laboratories. And Andrea studies our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And in particular, she studies black holes. Um, and she discovered this massive black hole in the center of our galaxy called Sagittarius A star. What I'd like you to consider, however, is that space is not the only final frontier. In fact, this three pounds of flesh between your ears is also one of our great final frontiers. And there are similarities between our Milky Way galaxy and our brains. The Milky Way has approximately 85 billion planets and each of your brains has approximately 85 billion neurons. And these neurons are the basic units of computation. Now, you've probably all seen a cartoon of a neuron, and I'll show you one in the next slide. You may have learned a little bit about how neurons work in school. We tend to draw neurons functioning as one neuron talking to another neuron. So the first myth that I think I need to dispel um, is this one-to-one -one communication. In fact, each neuron communicates with about 1,000 to 10,000 other neurons simultaneously. So neurons are really broadcasting, just like I'm talking to all of you now. And they do that through specialized structures on their dendrites, which you see here in these micrographs. If we blow up 
a dendrite here and look at it under high resolution microscopy, you can see that each of these little knobs is what's called a bouton. And these boutons make synaptic connections with other neurons. You can see how dense these boutons are. So that's one of the ways that neurons have this really highly multiplexed communication system. It's through their anatomy. All right, I promised you a cartoon of a neuron. This is actually a drawing that was produced by one of my first graduate students, um, Dr. Ziamara Perez. And so we can see here um, this kind of basic unit of communication. Uh, we have one neuron here in a cartoon talking to another neuron. And we can blow up their connections, which I just showed you in the micrograph here in the drawing. This is called a synapse. Now, one of the reasons that people surmise that brains work like computers is because when they're sending signals from their dendrites through their cell bodies and down their very long axons, that information is sent through something called an action potential. And I'm sure most of you have heard of an action potential. You probably know something about it. And action potentials, one of their features is that they are all or none, meaning that you either have one or you don't have one, right? They're yes or no. So they're digital, and that's how computers work. But in fact, neurons don't directly touch one another. They have this space between them. Um, it's a nanoscale space. It's about 20 nanometers. And every action potential, as it reaches the tip of the axon, has to be transduced into a purely chemical signal. And that happens through a process called exocytosis. So when an action potential stimulates a neuron, it causes the fusion of these synaptic vesicles with the presynaptic membrane. And these molecules of neurotransmitter, or neurochemical, are released into the synaptic space they also diffuse outside of the synaptic space for something called volume transmission. And they communicate the information from one neuron to the next. And this type of chemical signaling is analog, right? Um, chemistry is used to transmit information through something called diffusion gradients or flux. And this is analog information. So this is one of the reasons that your brain is nothing like a computer. And it's one of the reasons that it functions so efficiently. Um, again, here we can see um, in this picture this idea of transducing a, an electrical signal into a purely chemical signal. Now, neuroscientists didn't always know about this chemical signaling. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, the microscopy was not as advanced as the micrographs I showed you of the dendritic boutons. And so the best that scientists could do with a light microscope was to try to look as closely as they could at, this connection, at these connections between neurons, but they couldn't get enough resolution in their micrographs to tell them whether neurons actually touched one another or not. And this ended up being um, an argument in this early neuroscience community as to whether neurons actually communicate by direct action or whether there was an indirect action. Um, you see some famous drawings here. These are cerebellar Purkinje cells. Um, and these were made famous by another scientist uh, from Spain Santiago Ramon y Cal, and he also won the Nobel Prize for being able to make these types of micrographs. And he categorized a lot of the different types of neurons in the brain. It really wasn't until the experiments of a German scientist named Otto Louis that it was confirmed that neurons do not make direct connections with one another and that they must release some kind of a chemical to communicate with each other. Um, what, what Dr. Louis did was he removed the heart 
from, or the hearts, from two frogs. Um, I hope no one hears a little squeamish as I describe this experiment. So the first heart that he removed, he kept the vagus nerve attached to this heart. And he went ahead and he electrically stimulated the vagus nerve. You can see the stimulation here. And then he took the solution surrounding this heart and he pumped it into the perfusion solution of the donor heart. I'm sorry, the, the recipient heart. And in doing so, he found that if he stimulated one heart and simply took its bathing solution and put it on another heart, he would actually slow the intrinsic beating of the second heart. And these types of data from Otto Louis and other early scientists were confirmatory of the fact that with stimulation, neurons must be releasing some kind of a chemical into the space around them, and that that chemical is what is transmitting information. Um, if you'd like to read more about this, uh, there's a wonderful book written by Elliot Wallenstein called The War of the Soups and the Sparks. I love this name, I love the title of the book. The soups, of course, were the scientists that believed that there was chemical communication between neurons. And the sparks were the larger group of scientists at the time that believed that neurons directly touched one another. All right, so what's one of the great challenges then that we have in neuroscience. Um, in fact, those early experiments of Otto Louis involved a neurotransmitter that was later discovered to be acetylcholine. And you can see the structure, the chemical structure, of acetylcholine up here in the right. With time, we discovered, however, that neurons use many different types of neurochemicals to signal one another, to encode information. So this is really another way that brains are not anything like computers. Not only do they engage in analog communication, but they have many different channels of being able to communicate with each other. So not all neurons produce the same neurotransmitters. And yet, these neurons are highly overlapping in the brain, and these neurochemicals are all being secreted simultaneously into the extracellular space. Um, you see some of the more common and well-studied neurotransmitters here. Um, you may have heard of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which we see here on the upper left. Um, some people call this the pleasure chemical. We actually know a lot about what dopamine encodes in the brain. Um, it's responsible for encoding reward. And it's also responsible for encoding information about movement. And there's uh, a common neurological disorder, neurodegenerative disorder, called Parkinson's disease. And you may know someone who has Parkinson's disease. And in that case, a population of do dopamine neurons degenerates and that reduces the amount of dopamine that can be released into these movement circuits and then causes the types of problems and movement disorder that we see in Parkinson's disease. Here on the right, we see another neurotransmitter that you may have heard of, and this is serotonin. Some people call serotonin the mood molecule or the happy molecule, right? Um, you hear about it a lot in the public press. Um, I've spent my entire career studying serotonin, trying to figure out what types of information it encodes in the brain. And we know some things about what it does, but we don't really have very good high-resolution information about serotonin encoding. And one of the reasons we know a lot less about serotonin and these other neurotransmitters is because we don't have ways to measure them to be able to study how their concentrations change with time at high resolution, like we have been able to do with dopamine. So one of the challenges that we have as neuroscientists, and it was a challenge that my group decided to take on, 
was could we develop sensors for all of these other neurotransmitters to enable scientists to be able to study them at the level that we've been able to study dopamine so that we can learn more about what they do individually and together. And one of the difficulties when trying to approach this challenge uh, is that, as you can see, these different molecules, in some cases, are very different from one another, right? Here in this third row in purple, we see actually representatives from the largest class of neurochemicals. These are peptide neurotransmitters. Um, dynorphin is a neurotransmitter that's involved in pain. And this is the neurotransmitter and its receptors for which opioid drugs interact, right? And I don't know in the Czech Republic if it's similar to the United States, but we have an opioid crisis in the United States that involves substance use disorder and opioid drugs, okay? Those drugs interact with dynorphin receptors. Um, here on the right, you can see another neurotransmitter that you might have heard of called oxytocin. And oxytocin is released from a very tiny structure at the base of your brain called the hypothalamus. And it's responsible in some ways for social bonding. So for instance, we know that when you have a baby and you're holding your baby, men as well as women, when they look at their baby's face and look into its eyes, their brain releases oxytocin. And that oxytocin reinforces this pair bonding. And in work done by Thomas Insull, who was the former head of the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States and his colleagues at Emory University, we have also learned that oxytocin is released in adults when they undergo bonding. So we know something about what some of these neurotransmitters do. Um, you can see that they represent very different types of molecules. Peptides here, amino acids here. These are the two most common neurotransmitters in the brain, GABA and glutamate. About 95% of chemical neurotransmission is happening through these two substances alone. Um, you may know these two neurotransmitters here, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Or if you're British, we would call them adrenaline and noradrenaline. Okay? You, you release adrenaline when you're under stress, right? When your body is asked to do something very quickly to respond to a threat. And adrenaline is used in the, in the body. It's released from the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys. But it's also used in the brain as a neurotransmitter, as is norepinephrine. So the challenge in trying to develop a sensor or sensors for all of these different neurotransmitters, and there are many that I'm not showing here, is the fact that we need a sensor that's going to be able to detect chemicals from vastly different classes. And that's difficult for us as chemists. The flip side of this problem is that we also have to be able to differentiate molecules that are also very similar. So if we look here, again, at norepinephrine and epinephrine, they only differ here, right here. This is a methyl group, for those of you who have studied chemistry. So I need some kind of a sensing strategy that's going to be there, that allows me to address this heterogeneity, but also allows me to differentiate molecules that differ by a single functional group. And this is quite challenging and had never been done before. So I hope I've convinced you to start, why a brain is not like a computer, okay? We have all of these chemistries, they're all happening right now in your brain. Hopefully when you leave this room, you'll learn something new. Your brain and your plasticity will be changed. And I like to think about brains as being much more like music, right? In music, we have many layers. We have different instruments playing at the same time. In the piano, we have the right and left hand playing at the same time. So we have all of these different channels of notes 
that come together to make something beautiful and something different than each of those notes by themselves. And that's really how your brain is working. All right, so we have the challenge of making sensors. We also have the challenge of how to study the brain. Um, if you'd like to come to my lab, I'd be happy to enroll you in a study. I'm just gonna drill a small little hole in the back of your head and drop something in there. How many people wanna do it? Come on, put your hands up. <laughs> I knew there'd be somebody brave enough. In fact, I can't even get approved in the United States to do these experiments on healthy people, okay? So we are faced with another challenge as neuroscientists and neurochemists, which is what, what do we study? But it turns out that going all the way back to Charles Darwin in a book that he published in 1872, right? We all know Darwin, Darwin's theory of evolution. And based on what he had learned through comparative anatomy that allowed him to hypothesize that species evolved from common ancestors, he went one step further and he wrote this book about the expression of emotions in man and animals. And he hypothesized in this book that because our brains are similar to those of animals, because we evolved from common ancestors, that the circuitry that allows us to experience emotions is a similar circuitry in animals. Now, some of you in this audience may say, of course, that makes total sense. But I can tell you that there are scientists and I know this is being recorded, but I'm gonna go a little bit on the edge here, including the current head of the National Institute of Mental Health, that seem to think that animals don't have emotions. That animals, that only humans possess emotion. Okay. Darwin didn't think so 150 years ago. How many of you live with an animal? A dog or a cat? Well, many of us, right? Do they have emotions? <laughs> right. You spend time with your animal every day. You know when it's happy, you know when it's sad, you know it's happy to see you, okay? Cats, right, make this very classical pose, right? The hunched back, the puffed fur when they are threatened, okay? This is the fight or flight response that involves adrenaline, all right? It's the same response that happens in the cat that happens in you, okay? You're threatened, your adrenal glands pump out adrenaline, that causes a release of cortisol, which is a hormone that's also released from a different part of the adrenal gland, and that activates all of these processes that allow you to engage in the fight or flight response to protect yourself. Same thing in animals, okay? We know this, this is a fact. And again, we can trace this idea of animals having emotions just like humans. I'm um, going all the way back to another German or actually Austrian scientist, Conrad Lorenz. He sketched these different facial expressions of dogs and hypothesized that they were communicating emotions through facial expression. And Conrad Lorenz also won a Nobel Prize uh, for his work in ethology. Very recently, um, this paper was published in Science, and in this case, animals, these are mice now, they are given different kinds of stimuli. Here's a pain, here's a pain stimulus, a tail shock, sweet, which is a sugar solution. Mice like sugar just like, I just put sugar in my coffee, love sugar, okay? Fear. And using high-resolution imaging of, these my, of the mouse faces when they receive different types of stimuli, and using AI, okay, we use a lot of AI in science already. It's not new to us. We call it machine learning. All right, these scientists were able to actually decode and coordinate mouse facial expressions with different kinds of stimuli. All right? And I love this news article here 
If anyone wants to take a picture, I recommend this is a slide you want to take a picture of. Go to this, this article here. They cover three recent scientific papers that talk about emotion in cats. And cats are my favorite animals. These are two of my three cats here. Okay, and they're smiling at you. <laughs> they're happy to see you. Okay, again, um, in the cat cafe, which is about five minutes from my house, researchers studied the cats interacting with each other. They discovered that by recording these cats and their interactions, the cats actually make upward of about 300 different vocalizations. So they talk. Okay? They can say a lot through their different vocalizations. We can't actually hear the differences too well, but they can. They have facial expressions, okay? And we still debate why and how they purr. Okay, so we can study chemical neurotransmission in animals and hopefully learn something about how emotions arise in humans. Now, how can we do that study? How did we develop sensors and what are they like? I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about the basics. In our case, what we did and how we cracked this problem was that we used DNA as a way to recognize different chemical transmitters. Now, many of you or probably most of you in this room have had a vaccine for the COVID virus, right? That uses mRNA. Many of you also know that DNA encodes genetic information. So when DNA, when you have two strands that are complementary to each other in the nucleus, they encode your genes, right? Which tells your cells how to make proteins and tells your cells how to make new cells. But more recently, we have discovered that both DNA and RNA can exist as single strands. And when they are single-stranded, they can fold up upon themselves and make three-dimensional architectures. And those architectures are governed by the DNA sequence. Now, if we can find a very rare DNA sequence that folds up in such a way that it can recognize, let's say, serotonin, then we can use that DNA as a type of artificial receptor. And these artificial receptors are called aptamers. So you can take one new English word home with you. I think it's the same word in, in all of science, aptamer. Okay? So DNA does a lot of interesting things in this cell, and we're still learning about that. We take DNA and we put it on transistors, okay? And you know transistors, everybody here has a cell phone, a computer, right? These are great digital signal transducers. And so the challenge for us was how could we make electronic sensors, because there's a lot of great things we can do when we use electronics or transistors, how could we marry that with some kind of a biomolecule that could recognize individual neurotransmitters? recognize large classes, different molecules, and also differentiate molecules that are very similar. And so we've been able to do that. And in doing so, we were able to advance science. Now, I didn't do this alone. I work, as Tamash said, with a large team of people in interdisciplinary research. So I'm gonna to touch on some of the key players. Uh, first of all, I've been collaborating for many years with Professor Paul Weiss, who you see here up in the right. Um, and Paul likes to say that we were first colleagues, then collaborators, and now we're actually married to each other. So scientists don't get out of the lab much. We often end up with one another. Um, and here on the left, you see one of the fantastic, talented graduate students that did a lot of this early work. Her name is Nako Nakatska, and she just recently started her own lab here in Switzerland at EPFL. She was a triathlete at UCLA. So, a little cartoon of what these sensors look like. Here in the little black squiggly, you see our single-stranded DNA. This is the receptor, okay? And we chemically affix that here to a semiconductor in blue. Semiconductors are not conductors, they're not insulators, they're in the middle. And you can control how well they conduct 
in our case electrons, how well electrons flow by gating them. The key here is that DNA has tons of negative charge. Every single unit of the DNA molecule has one negative charge associated with it. And so when a DNA strand that recognizes, let's say, serotonin, when it binds to serotonin, it changes its shape, that moves its negative charge, and that gates how well electrons flow between this source and drain electrode of the transistor. Okay, so now you know something about transistor physics. Okay, and we can fabricate these, we can microfabricate these at high densities on these types of silicon probes, and we can place these in the brain, and we can record then from these transistors. All right, here you see an actual device. They're quite small. All right, they're flexible. This is silicon, so these are microfabricated on silicon. In this case, the tip of this device is 150 microns by 150 microns. All right, so uh, a little, you know, I'm trying to think of something that would be comparative to. Not a hair, it's bigger than a hair, a little bigger than a hair. Okay, very, very sharp needle. And on the tip, almost too small to see with the human eye, are the transistors. And we can fabricate them at very high densities. Let's see if we can advance now. There we go. Um, here you can see some micrographs of what actual devices look like up close. Um, these are the smallest devices that we've fabricated so far. In this case, the tips are only 50 microns wide and 50 microns thick. And you can see we can fabricate individual transistors on these. And this work was done by another fantastic graduate student in the lab. He's now Dr. Chuanjin Zhao, and he's a postdoc at Stanford University. And the work was done in collaboration with another engineer at UCLA, Professor Hal Mambuket. A little more about aptamers, and this is where I like to tell a little story. Um, just like I'm doing today, scientists often travel all over the world to give talks. And I've got to be honest with you, it's really exciting, but sometimes it's tiring. Like, there are days when I just don't want to leave my home and my cats and pack up my bags and change nine time zones, okay? And sometimes I think we ask ourselves as scientists, you know, why am I doing this? Particularly after the pandemic, when we, we developed Zoom. Why, why don't I do everything by Zoom now? Right? I don't have to get on a plane, come nine time zones to see you. Like, my face could be up on the screen. But it turns out that by going to different places, just like I'm doing for the next two weeks, and interacting with all of these new colleagues here in the Czech Republic, new scientists, we form new collaborations. We learn things about each other, and we develop new science. So. Part of the breakthrough for these types of sensors happened because I went to a meeting in Finland. And Finland is a long way from LA. Um, in this case, I went to the University of Uvascula, which is almost at the Arctic Circle. I was invited to speak at their nano days in late October. I think there was just four hours of sunlight a day by then. Okay, it was dark, it was cold, which is really hard from someone, hard for people from LA. Okay, and I went and I gave my talk. This is the bridge that connects the two halves of the campus for the University of Uvascula. And at the end of the day, as we often do, all the speakers were standing next to each other and they wanted to take some photographs for posterity. And I was standing next to this scientist. Um, this is Professor Kurt Godolf from iNano in the Netherlands. He runs a very powerful nanoscience center. He's a really tall guy. And he's looking down at me, and he said, nice talk. And I said, thank you. Um, this was about seven, eight years ago. And I had, we just had our first sensing data. And he said, well, we tried to make a sensor for dopamine using aptamers. It didn't work. It was the biggest failure of my career. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy runs a huge center. He has all the resources and money and it didn't work for him. I'm like, oh my, am I doing the right thing here, right? Is this actually gonna, gonna get me any place I need to go? And the beauty of going all the way to Uvascular Finland in October and standing next to Kurt for 10 minutes was that he said to me, 
I know somebody at the university, at, at Columbia University in New York City, and they are the world's expert in aptamers, but they're not very well known. And I said, does this person have a name? And he said, yes, the, the guy's name is Milan Stojanovic. Okay, I wasn't born with the name Ann Andrews. My name is Ann Milicinic. Okay, I'm actually half Slovak and half Croatian. And people in this part of the world may know that Milicinic is a Croatian name and Stojanovic is a Serbian name. Okay, and Croatians and Serbians don't get along sometimes, right? <laughs> we had war over it. So I get home, I call Professor Stojanovic, and I said, I understand you're an aptamer expert. He said, yes, I am. I said, I'd really like to have an aptamer for my favorite neurotransmitter, serotonin. He said, I have one already. We made one. We thought we'd analyze serotonin in urine. I was like, in urine? Why would you want to do that? The beauty of aptamers, not only is that they're small, highly negative, negatively charged, and can, can transduce signals on transistors very exquisitely, but with DNA sequence, he sent me an email, and in just a minute, I had the sequence. I got it, ordered it from a company, and I had a sensor. And that led to this breakthrough paper here. Physicists said we couldn't do this. We didn't. Okay, we made a sensor for serotonin, for dopamine, for glucose, and for a membrane lipid. We understood, we investigated the mechanism of action, and we were able to publish this in the top scientific journal. And again, here's Nako finishing her first marathon, and there's Milan. Okay, so a cartoon again of what the sensors look like. This is the sensor for serotonin on the right. This is dopamine on the left. The aptamer is here. You can see each of these little pegs is a base. You can see the negative charge. This is the semiconductor. In our case, we're using an N-type semiconductor. It conducts electrons. And you can see in this case for the aptamer for dopamine, when it binds a molecule of dopamine, it changes its shape. It brings negative charge closer to the semiconductor. That makes it harder for these electrons to flow. Right? Negative charge repels electrons because electrons are negatively charged. Conversely, for a different aptamer with a different sequence that binds to serotonin, when serotonin binds, the aptamer changes conformation so that the negative charge moves away from the semiconductor, and that allows electrons to flow more freely. And we can measure this using electronics. This is the only graph I'll show you today. But this was our these are our first sensing data in vivo in the mouse brain. So we used that little probe that I told you. Okay, we implanted that here into the striatum. This is that area of the brain that degenerates in Parkinson's disease. We put a stimulating electrode here in the base of the brain where the serotonin neuron neuronal cell bodies are. We stimulated, and every time we stimulated at our sensors, we could see serotonin levels go up. You can see the individual traces here. This is a stimulus. In addition to fabricating these neuroprobes on silicon, which is still rather stiff to go into the brain, we can also fabricate these types of probes on soft and flexible substrates. And in this case, I'm showing you fabrication. At, this is at wafer scale. You can see the very high density probes. Here's the size, and this is on polyimid, which is a soft polymer, okay? Here are the transistors on the tips. And using a shuttle device, Chuan Zhen was able to show that we can implant these very soft neuroprobes into a brain mimic. Soft is good if we want to make long-term recordings. If I put a needle device into the brain, you know, your head, when you move your head, your brain moves up to three millimeters in your skull, okay? If I put a stiff device in there, every time the head moves in a mouse or in any kind of animal, you're cutting the tissue. And this causes inflammation, and this causes repeated inflammation. So stiff probes are only good for measuring things over short periods of time. But let's say we want to study something like learning, 
And we need to do that over days to weeks to months. We need these kinds of soft devices that move with the brain and don't cause inflammation and encapsulation. All right, very quickly, I'm going to cover one application beyond making brain measurements. The most common genetic disorder, uh, autosomal dominant disorder, is something called phenylketonuria, or PKU. All babies across most of the world are tested for this disorder at birth. They take a little heel prick, tiny drop of blood. They test phenylalanine levels. In this case, for these individuals who have PKU, they have a gene deficiency such that they cannot process phenylalanine levels. Phenylalanine is an amino acid we get from our diet. They have high phenylalanine levels in the blood, and this impacts brain development. It can be so severe as to cause uh, severe intellectual disabilities. This genetic disorder is, is treated throughout the entire life of the individual by keeping them on a low phenylalanine diet. This is an engineered, manufactured diet. I'm told it tastes terrible. Kids do not like to eat it. They can never have a cookie. They can never have a hamburger. And this has to last for the rest of the life. Okay, not only that, people don't have feedback on their phenylalanine levels. Many of these individuals can tolerate a little bit of phenylalanine from the diet, but not a lot. But they have no way of knowing what their blood phenylalanine levels are. So, Kevin Chung, when he was a graduate student in my laboratory, he developed an aptamer transistor sensor for phenylalanine. And I'm showing you just a little bit of the data here. I'm sorry, two graphs. Um, we made a mouse model using a drug. And in this case, you can see using our sensors that in the animals that receive this drug, we can see an increase in phenylalanine in the blood versus normal animals here. So this means we now have the possibility of developing a wearable sensor for people with PKU, just like a continuous glucose monitor that diabetics now wear, so that they can know what their phenylalanine levels are. They get feedback immediately, this idea of personalized monitoring. So they can know, can I have just a little bit of normal food? For someone who has to be on an engineered diet for the rest of their life, to have just two bites of a hamburger is probably really wonderful. We've also developed a sensor for cortisol. And I mentioned cortisol to you, right? Cortisol is, a, is stimulated in its release when you are under threat or under stress, right? Your adrenal glands release adrenaline, and adrenaline causes cortisol release. Now, one of the problems with cortisol release and stress is that our bodies are exquisitely designed to deal with threat, and often, Threat involves a physical response, and that's what we are evolved to do. Where we run into trouble is in our modern world. Our bodies and our evolution have not caught up to the fact that most of us are under chronic psychosocial stress, right? You're caught in traffic, you're running late, you had a fight with your roommate, okay? All of these things cause chronic elevation in cortisol. And our bodies aren't really designed to deal with these kind of long-term elevations. This causes inflammation, causes dysregulation of glucose, and it's one of the major risk factors for developing anxiety and depression. And we know how important that is, particularly today, during the pandemic and in the post-pandemic time. How many of you have, I have a little bit of agoraphobia now. I was locked in my house for so long, now I feel like I don't want to go out like I used to, right? Okay? People have higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of depression. The war here in Europe is causing a lot of stress to a lot of people. And so one of the things we wanted to do was to develop a wearable sensor for cortisol. We felt it would be important for people to have feedback on their cortisol levels, how they vary with time, because each of us is different. And so we developed that. You could see uh, the student wearing it here. It looks like a smartwatch. It is. And it measures cortisol in sweat, non-invasive. OK? We validated this sensor. This work was done in collaboration with a professor of electrical engineering at UCLA, Sam Amaninajad, his postdoc, Bo Wong, and Professor Janet Tomiyama. Cortisol actually undergoes a daily rhythm. <laughs> 
When you, shortly before you awaken in the morning, your body starts to produce a little bit more cortisol. And the purpose of this is to mobilize you for movement. Cortisol increases blood glucose. And so we know that cortisol is highest when you wake up in the morning and lowest when you go to bed at night. And so here you can see on the bottom, these are continuous measurements, um, right? We're on the second time scale here. So about every 10 seconds, we're taking a cortisol measurement in sweat. This is done on a human. And you can see that we can detect these higher cortisol levels in the morning versus the lower cortisol levels at night. We also validated this sensor for stress. Okay, so we used a test, and this is work done in Janet's lab. It's something called the Trier Stress Test. And it's very similar to what I'm doing now. How many of you like to give talks, public speeches? Anybody like to do it? Well, I'm not seeing a lot of hands. A few. Oh, she, she likes to have the hole drilled in her head, too. Okay, you can come with me. You'll stay with my lab. Um, most people do not like to get up and talk in front of other people. Okay, and so the try our stress tests, we get volunteers at the university, they're often students. We don't tell them what the test is gonna be. They come, they rest, we take them into a room. We have three very stern people standing at the front of the room, sitting at the front, they have white coats and serious faces. And then we tell the student, okay, the test is that you have to give this five minute speech, here's your speech, Right away, their stress goes up. And then we say, when you're done with your speech, you have to count backwards from 100 by intervals of seven, okay? And here's what happens to your cortisol, right? Here, this is 71 individuals who took this test. Here's the test here in red. These are cortisol levels that were measured using a standard laboratory assay and a blood draw. And you can see the cortisol goes up and comes down. So we definitely gave these guys a bit of stress. Okay, we also measured cortisol in their saliva, and then we correlated sweat and saliva. And not shown in the slide, in some individuals who used our smartwatch, and we measured their cortisol levels in their sweat. And we could show, just like the standard laboratory measure, that we could detect this brief stress-related elevation in cortisol. All right, the future. We've continued to collaborate with Milan Stojanovic and his very talented senior scientist, Cassie Yang. Uh, we published now, very recently, this second paper on these sensors in science. And in this paper, we report on uh, oh, close to 25 new aptamers for neurotransmitters. So this is 24 more aptamers than anybody ever reported in a single paper. I don't even know if there are 25 aptamers that were known in the literature prior to this paper. That's how good this group at Columbia is. And my student, my current graduate student, Noelle Mitchell, worked here with Cassie Yang on this work. So we now have aptamer receptors for many of those molecules I showed you in that complex slide. So we can make sensors not only for the 12 things that we've already done, but we're now moving closer to our goals of being able to sense many different neurotransmitters. We also want to do this at the same time, right? I told you these, these chemical communication channels are overlaid. And up until now, neuroscientists have really focused on studying single things at a time, but that's not really how the brain works. So we want to be able to study how neurotransmitters interact with each other. So we're using these neuroprobes. This is actually a probe for electrophysiology made by my colleague at UCLA, Professor Sotiris Masmanidis. We're swapping out these electrodes for transistors, and we are adding different aptamers, and we're addressing them to individual transistors so that we can do multiplex measurements in vivo. And finally, I told you there's not a lot we can do in humans, but we do have a goal of being able to make neurochemical measurements at high resolution in behaving humans. And how we would like to do that is to coordinate with something called deep brain stimulation, which you see here. So there are about 250,000 people worldwide who already have these stimulating electrodes implanted permanently in their brains. Many of these people are Parkinson's disease patients. These are people who have 
early onset Parkinson's disease. The medications only work for 10, 15 years, and then the system has, the dopamine system has degenerated so much the medications can no longer work. And these people with early onset Parkinson's, because they got their Parkinson's when they were young, people like Michael J. Fox, they can live a long time. And so they're candidates to have these electrodes implanted in the brain. And these electrodes can be used to stimulate the areas um, where the degeneration has occurred. We're now starting to investigate the use of deep brain stimulation to treat neuropsychiatric illnesses. Now, of course, this would not be a routine treatment, but we're looking at patients, again, who are refractory to medication. For instance, we have patients who have what we call treatment, whoops, resistant depression. We've tried every medication, and they don't work for some, for some small numbers of patients. So we're trying to see if we can figure out the right areas of the brain that we could stimulate to help these patients. And what we envision in my research group is that on these electrodes, just like I showed you that we make for animals, we can also hopefully put our transistor sensors for neurotransmitters. And for the first time, we hope in the not too distant future, we'll be able to make recordings of neurotransmitters in real time in humans when they're behaving. And finally, as I said, we're working on sensors for the body, wearable sensors. Um, this was not what I envisioned when I got started in this research. So science sometimes takes you in places that you don't imagine you'll go. But I've become very interested in this idea of personalized monitoring. There's a lot we can learn um, about the individual that's important in terms of predicting future disease states. And so we're developing sensors. I showed you the sensor for cortisol. Um, these would be akin uh, to this wearable sensor that's now commercially available for glucose. This is a continuous glucose monitor um, used in diabetics in the United States. Anybody can now get this sensor. Healthy people can get this sensor. I'm usually wearing one. I'm not today, but, and you can learn about your own glucose levels. Okay. We're developing sensors. This is uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Noelle is working on this. And we have a manuscript that is in review right now where we've developed a wearable sensor to measure ovulatory hormones with high accuracy. So we hope in the future we'll have a wearable device that will measure estradiol, progesterone, and LH in sweat that can be used by women everywhere to predict ovulation with high accuracy. And that will be useful not only for facilitating conception, but could be used as a way to prevent conception. And this is important, of course, in the United States, as you may know, uh, we recently had an overturning of Roe v. Wade, and we have 12 states in our country right now where abortion is illegal. And in addition, those states are restricting access to hormonal birth control. So there are lots of reasons why people would want to have a wearable device to tell them when they're ovulating. To conclude, I'd like to thank the partners here in the Czech Republic for helping to sponsor my two weeks. I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot. I already have. It's a really exciting trip. Cat Chem, who is represented here by Eva, um, the Czech National Academies of Science, the Czech Institute for Inorganic Chemistry. And in the United States, a number of agencies who funded the research that I've shown you, um, the National Institute of mental health, I received a director's award, transformative award, which allowed us to push this research forward. Research does not happen without money and smart people. And I'll stop there. And thank you very much.